Welcome back. Today we will start the UPSC third paper and this paper focuses on the developments in economics and science and technology. Most of the questions from science and technology were really really conventional and predictable in the nature like what the kind of question could be as we discussed during the expected classes. Many of the topics turned out like you had the stem cell project, you had the fast breeder reactor and so on. From economics, most of the topics were based on perspective understanding. So inclusive growth was one of the major focuses that government had and that was part of the question so the first question let's talk about among the several factors for india's potential growth saving rate is the most effective one do you agree and what are the factors for the potential uh, growth so we have to explain the economic growth explain in summary the difference between the growth and development so explain under growth we talk about the rise in the gdp the rise in the per capita income you can briefly explain the Harrod Domer model where we explain the capital uh, output ratio as a ratio of the savings. So we measure growth rate as the ratio of the savings to the capital output ratio. Besides that, you have numerous factors that boost the growth of industries. For example, good, good institutional structure would be one. The health care or the health infrastructure of a government. So a healthy government would have a better productivity output so that that is something to be considered then we talk about the role of the private sectors mobilization of the private sector incoming or the development of the service sector a boost has been provided to the service sector which is considered to be a fair amount in the gdp ratio nowadays as compared to the manufacturing we also talk about reducing the capital output ratio as we have already talked about in the Harrod Dahmer model. So increasing the rate of industries, developing more labor intensive industries, acquiring land, making the system much more transparent, the leasing of the land, the acquisition of the land to be simplified, the taxation system to, be beco to become much more streamlined are some of the major factors that we talk about. However, despite that, uh, within the Indian infrastructure, we see uh, issues like monsoon, uh, crop failures. So all those affect the agro-allied industries. Similarly, we have the delay in the projects, uh, the policy paralysis. So policy at one point of time is released, but slowly and gradually we see no developments in the policy or a very gradual development. So those are some of the issues that we need to address. On the other hand, we also need to focus on the investments, both domestic and foreign investments. So domestic investments can be in the banks, in the investment funds like mutual funds, stock markets, EFTs and so on. We also have to talk about how uh, the investment uh, rate is finally leading to less growth. So focusing on major investments and bringing in investment drives, foreign investment into India would be some of the major parameters that we need to focus on. The next question is accounting for the failure of the manufacturing industry or the manufacturing sector in achieving the goal of labor intensive exports rather than capital intensive exports. So a very important point that we are trying to highlight under inclusive growth is promoting labor intensive industries. When you have labor intensive industries like garment apparel industries, you have the various schemes for uh, the various industries for leather manufacturing all these are highly labor intensive so a labor intensive uh, industry would absorb much more human resources as a result uh, the development the overall development of the nation would get a thrust so the idea is to achieve more labor intensive exports and what could be the measures for those are need to be addressed so definitely the labor laws should be relaxed the sector that is employed in the informal economy should slowly and gradually be tra transformed into the formal sector. The skill development under the various skill development, the Kaushal Vikas Pariyojana are some of those that we need to mention. Export promotion schemes for labor intensive industries, for example, a boost to handicrafts. So handicrafts from India are boosted. Similarly, Khadi India is one of the uh, trade uh, symbols that is now being given for export promotion then we are 
definitely besides these what we need to work around is quality so unless and until you are producing good quality exports won't be that good so quality production is important to produce a good quality we need to have various relaxations in labor laws various relaxation in terms of taxation a good industrial corridor that must be developed and uh, reducing the burden on the employer for the security benefits to the uh, employees and also we are talking about foreign collaborations so how we can conclude good agreements with foreign countries for promotion of exports so those are some of the important highlights that you need to address here as i said in the previous lecture as well for statistics and the section on economics if unless and until you substantiate your data with the statistics it does not make a really good answer so bring out the statistics that we have been doing through discussing the yojanas and the kurukshetra through the various monthly editions the next question talks about development of airport in india through joint venture under public private partnership model and what are the challenges that are faced now we are focusing on airport development udan scheme is one of the major schemes that is bringing a good thrust to it where we say ude desh ka aam nagrik we also need to address how the role of private partnership is important but this cannot be uh, fully worked around unless and until you have public cooperation so land acquisitions uh, relaxation in the norms acquisition and the law lines for demarcation of the land for private ownerships again we need to address the airport maintenance so private airlines should work around that rehabilitation of the affected pe people who are being affected from the area under which you have the airport development that is taking place definitely it involves a lot of capital risk the rate of returns are low in the initial years uh, we also need to chalk down the viability so the project viability the viability of the location is something that we need to address on for example recently you have a new scz coming in dolera and you have a new airport being located at that site so we need to identify the viability the returns that would be there down the lane in short term as well as long term so you can bring in case studies and uh, also address the issues that were laid down under the kelkar committee report for public private partnership so since this question talks about public private partnership give a brief idea about the kelkar committee recommendations on public private partnership the next question talks about the various types of revolution now this could be a indeed very long answer it depends on you how you lay down the framework for the answer so we need to talk about the revolutions that have helped in poverty alleviation and food security under uh, the revolutions we had numerous revolutions green revolution was for the increase in the maize uh, in increase in the wheat and the rice production along with uh, little amount of maize we could say it was mainly focused with hyv seeds the high yielding variety seeds fertilizers and agricultural machineries then now what we are talking about is an evergreen revolution in the meantime we talked about the organic revolution where we talked about the paramparagrat krishi vikas yojana we also talk about the rainbow revolution which covers all the aspects so apiculture sericulture are some of the aspects that are integrated into the rainbow revolution we also talk about yellow revolution where we uh, focus on the growth of edible oils mustard seeds and so on green revolution focuses on fertilizers sweet revolution is related to honey production so all of those are related to poverty alleviation food security and generating more employment options within the region so briefly mention all these revolutions how uh, a kind of technology driven scheme can be beneficial for higher production and better results the next question talks about the reasons for poor acceptance of cost effective small processing units how food processing units would be helpful to uplift the socio economic status so here we have to address the issues of cold chain uh, the uh, value addition at every stage that takes place mainly the perishable units that we take into account so poor acceptance of the cost effective small processing units could be accounted due to lack of cold chain supply systems no proper marketing facilities so under that we now try to bring in e nam that is electronic national agricultural market we talk about the quality of food products the food habits of the people uh, the, there is a lack of regular supply of inputs so regularity in the supply of inputs is very very essential and 
we also need to see whether if the units are very small they are economically viable or not so making units economically viable is again a very very important issue under this we have the kurukshetra april edition where we have talked about technology for rural development especially the root ag and that's very very important part of this answer so just go through this lecture and you would have many more points to understand now this topic as we said is a kind of conventional question from science which deals with stem cell therapy so stem cell therapy is a unique therapy which is basically used wherever you cannot do a transplant so let's say bone marrow transplantation is not possible so stem therapy or stem cell therapy is the only way out similarly for brain issues brain transplant is not possible so stem cell therapy is the way out so stem cell therapy basically uses the stem cell to treat the disease or the condition so whenever you cannot do a transplant you do a stem cell therapy recently this has been used a lot there is also preservation of the stem cells that is going on on uh, a kind of experimental basis in many regions and some of the therapies have been derived from even the umbilical cord blood that has been seen so those are some of the ways under which we understand the stem cell therapy the importance of cell, stem cell therapy and usually it has a kind of very simple procedure which even does not involve a complicated surgery so those are some of the major issues it would over the long run help to reduce the morbidity or the mortality rate for those looking for the transplantation and can even provide a kind of permanent solution to many problems the next is now we are late to talk about this question in fact very late to talk about this question because this question focuses on the unmanned missions of india like chandrayaan and uh, the mangalyaan however the question says we have not yet ventured into the manned space mission but as of now we have already ventured into the manned space mission that's gaganyaan so as i said we are late to discuss this topic however if we were discussing it one year prior uh, we would have talked about the mars orbit project that's the mom project which was launched with the first attempt at a very low cost which was nearly one tenth of the cost that us is paying for it then if you are answering this question now you have to definitely bring about gaganyaan however we have to focus on the issues like how india got it got its membership into mctr that is the missile technology control regime uh, without which other members of the group do not have the technology which is related to the space science also we are working on the researches for life life support system the crew cabin the crew escape system and uh, better uh, reliability and safety measures the next question again a very predictive question is on interlinking of the rivers in simple words the idea is uh, we have certain parts of india where you have the rivers which are flooded so let's take the eastern part of the ganga brahmaputra where you have high flooding that takes place on the other hand we have desert areas of rajasthan saurashtra uh, parts of Marath marathwada and vidarbha so those are the regions where you have deficient or scanty rainfall if we do a interlinking of the rivers what would happen is this water could be equally distributed across the country major benefit would come in terms of navigation in terms of inland water transportation which is considered as a cheapest source of transportation much more cheaper than railways than roadways or airways so those are some of the things that we need to bring about definitely the floods on one side and the droughts on the other side could be balanced up and the issues of the floods and the droughts can be resolved this would lead to increase in the gdp by nearly 5 to 6% we have numerous case studies which was leading to the working of the three rivers the tapti project and so on so those have been covered here you can just go back and refer these articles for developments however this definitely has certain limitations in hand the first is the limitation regarding the ecological imbalance for connecting the river interconnecting the river there would be displacement or rehabilitation of the people that would take place some of the areas might be submerged and uh, as i said the cost of displacing the people and rehabilitating the people is something that's really really important and we need to take into consideration so those are a very very important point again as i said 
Interlinking is a very very important topic not only for your paper 1 or your GS part but also for your optional papers specifically those hailing from geography. This becomes a very important question. The next question again a very very predictive question in light of the Warner cry that's the ransomware. The question was on the potential threats of cyber attack and the security frameworks. So when we are in India we talk about certain that's the computer emergency response team as a security framework or a preventive measure potential th threat definitely includes stealing of the data affecting the data uh, fraudulent transactions that could take place on your behalf uh, then you could have ransomware issues like that that was there for the wanna cry uh, these could create international or uh, uh, kind of disturbed relation with foreign nations considering the fact that that cyber uh, crime or cyber attack originated into a particular country which is affecting the other countries so you have issues re relating to digital disruptions dis uh, disturbed denial of service act similarly what could be the security framework a good password a strong password awareness among people the response teams the work of the cert in, in india or the cert teams then we have the firewall protection antivirus malware protection uh, dedicated national level team we have the various nodal agencies which are working for cyber security you have projects like Megdu that have been started so those are some of the efforts on indian behalf we have covered a lecture on digital reforms in india so that's an another uh, point where you can uh, substantiate your answer with the various things that have been developed in india through the years the various apps the Suraksha coverage that we talk about. Similarly, there are two terms that we need to at attend here. First is the bleeding edge and the other is air gapping. Bleeding edge refers to a technology which is not yet released to the public, but it is ready. So those are the kind of technologies we are really working on. Similarly, you have air gapping. That's a security measure that involves isolating a system from the remaining systems. And as a result, the network won't be affected because of it. So you create a gap and that's known as air gapping system. Similarly, we have recently a submit which was known as Ground Zero Submit, which was one of the very largest collaborative platforms for cyber, cyber security experts that was done. So issues like those need to be addressed. The last question is a very important question and a kind of very predictive co uh, question again, the insurgency in the Northeast India. Now we have a kind of history which lays behind the insurgency. The Northeast is surrounded by five international uh, or five international borders we can say that's Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, China and Nepal. We have seven sisters and one brother that's Sikkim that we consider as a part of Northeast. We have a land corridor which is nearly 22 kilometers which runs through a narrow gap and connects the parts of India. This first started in Nagaland where you had the Britishers, it was even before the Britishers left India. So you had the Naga National Council that was established by FISO and they tried to declare themselves independent. Similarly, later on this was split into two, one was the Socialist Council and from that you had the two sections, the IM and the K that were split within the Socialist Council. Similarly, in the Mizoram, you had the Mizo National Front that was working hard for the independence of the Mizoram. You had various militant out outfits in Tripura. You had the National Liberation Front that was active in Tripura and the All India, uh, All Tripura Tiger Force that was active. Uh, various pre-volatile conditions was there. The forest area was one of the major issues that were addressed, the tribal people that were affected. Uh, the backward tracks which were kept willingly backward by the Britishers and a kind of alienation that was developed due to poor connectivity uh, from the Northeast was some of the reasons that really pushed up this insurgency into the Northeast and there was a high migration that was seen of the non-local people into that area which led to a lot of political controversies. 1956 was the period when you have a kind of very high uh, scenes of insurgency that were reported mainly in the villages in Nagaland and it was the scene where army used to burn down villages and it was a kind of very fearful situation that was created. So those kind of uh, conflicts and hardships have led to a lot of insurgency however as of now we are trying 
to look on to a positive development uh, in our northeast control the insurgency to a high amount and those are some of the things that we need to mention as a part of this answer with this we cover the first 10 questions of your gs paper 3 2017 solutions will be working around the next 10 set of questions in the upcoming class and also we'll be covering your paper 4 gs before your mains examination so stay tuned have a great day ahead